talking to Robert Sherman. He is a writer for stage and screen and radio and books and probably everything else. Uh, probably best known for the 2005 Doctor Who story, Dalek. Can you start by telling us what attracted you to writing? Were you into creative arts in school? I, I had a really bad stammer. And that sounds silly, but um, it was my only way in which I could easily communicate. And I found the way out of stammering a little bit by trying to do some acting at school. And I did a lot of that, and it helped me get over the nervousness of speaking. But I also realised, you know, I wanted to then be an actor, and I realised, going to things like National Youth Theatre, that I was rubbish. I was a really terrible actor, with, still with a speech problem. And so there was this sort of synergy. Suddenly I wanted, I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to express myself that way, but I could write drama. Initially the idea I'd write things that I could appear in. And then very, very quickly I realised that I wouldn't want anyone nearly as bad as me ruining those plays. So I became a playwright accidentally and the writing sort of just kept going and I, I always believed that you know, things like TV writing or book writing were things that sort of maybe posher and proper writers did. But over the years I sort of got into those as well. So it, it's an odd thing. It sort of felt, I always felt deliberately I wanted to be a writer but I wasn't quite sure what sort of writer I wanted to be. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a constantly evolving thing. What was your first paid writing job then? I have a couple of short stories published in a long out of print book which was about mini sagas. The idea that you would write precisely 50 word stories. And I wrote a couple of those and they're in there and they say my age in the book because I think I got in on the basis of being a young under 18 writer. It was actually a couple of years later though, I, I was at university and I won the World Drama Trust Award for a play I wrote which Alan Aitborn judged. And Alan in future years became a producer who commissioned a lot of plays by me. And out of that I got Arts Council commissions and, and I sort of found myself quite quickly becoming someone actually earning a reasonable wage at writing stage plays so it was it was quite a quick process I was suddenly 21 maybe and I was just writing play after play after play and, and getting paid for it. Which form of writing do you think comes more naturally to you is it scripts or is it prose or is it dialogue? I think it depends actually what you're doing most at the time at the moment because I've been doing it almost exclusively for the last 10 years writing books uh, I find prose now a joy I mean I really enjoy writing prose but I found, until I was 37 when I began doing it, I found prose impossible. And at that point, drama, particularly stage drama, some radio drama maybe, which has a similar feel to stage drama, that seemed very, very natural. And I think if I went back to stage drama with an actual commission again, which might happen at some point, um, I hope I just slot back naturally into that. I, I think that my most natural thing is probably stage playwriting. In your own uh, works, you're creating your own characters as opposed to in something like Doctor Who where you're using established characters. Uh, what's your usual method for developing a character? Do you build the character around the story or vice versa? I honestly don't know because I don't ask myself those questions. I think that what I do is stories for me start in any number of ways. It can be a theme I want to explore, it can be a, an intellectual conceit, it can be an image of something I see or a character I want to get out and the other parts of it then get shaded in which can be the bits which are missing, which could be character or plot or anything but any of those can be a starting point dependent upon what the thing is. I think when you watch them or read them it's often hard to tell whether that was a, a thing which began because you wanted to explore a character or wanted to or explore an image. I hope that they grow around them enough that you can't necessarily tell what the starting point was, but I try and keep myself fairly free to it actually. I, I, I think that every time you write, it should feel like a new, it sounds pretentious, I'm sorry, but it should feel a bit like a new birth and that you're, and you're recreating your method of writing. I, as soon as I start getting too reliant upon what I've done before, which I've done a few times, and you think, well, okay, I always go out at this time, and I write in this exercise book, and I write this sort of thing, and, it's based, and I have this sort of idea, and I develop it. That's the point when you have to start rebelling and saying, right, I'm doing it differently from now on. I'm going to go somewhere differently and start with different ideas and start with a different point of view. And that way you keep yourself fresh. Because writing is, is still only writing. And I, think, I think there's a danger in getting almost a bit too trapped in, in, in having the same kick, if you like. 
you've had uh, stage plays and screen and radio etc where actors are portraying your characters do actors portrayals affect the way you write in future if you know you're getting the same actor in again yeah I mean it has happened um, if you're writing for repertory theatre and you realise that you're writing for the same company across a season more than once but in actual fact it's usually about trying to stretch them so that you if you have an actor who did a sort of comedic part for you before you want to see if they can do something different and part of it's actually to do with not wanting an actor to believe I can only do one thing because I want to show off and I'm nervous of actors I, I am because actors in actors take what I do and I feel therefore every night I'm on st they're on stage doing my work that they're constantly judging me so I don't want them to feel I'm doing that same old Shearman shtick I did last time I mean, for example, the most obvious example is when they cast Chris Eccleston as Doctor Who. And I was several drafts into writing The Doctor for that script. And I suddenly had Chris. And I wanted to try and capture a sense of what Chris's voice was. So I watched a lot of Chris's work. And I listened a lot to... There's a, there's a track called You Lot by Orbital, which features Chris speaking from The Second Coming. I listened to that a lot. I think it's a bit patronising for the actor, actually, if you try and... Try, try and mimic what you think they can already do. Writing for Doctor Who, um, you wrote a couple of audio stories for Big Finish. Uh, a dozen, yeah, yeah. Two of the which uh, are my, well, some of my personal favourites uh, featured uh, the talking penguin Frobisher. Penguin? Yeah. Who was a quite controversial character. I suppose. Yeah. It's a talking penguin. <laughs> Did you research the character before you started writing? Were you familiar with him before you started writing it? I knew who he was. Um, I was never a big comic strip reader. So I was aware of Frobisher because he was a comic strip character back when I was a teenager in Doctor Who magazine. And I had found him amusing, but I didn't ever imagine I'd be writing for him. Read maybe a couple of strips, you know, full stories, and then thought, yeah, OK. I didn't want to research over much because you don't you want to make it your character too and you and also you're aware that the actor will make it their character because the actor I'm quite certain in this case a chap called Robert Jezik he won't have read the comic strip so he'll only be basing himself upon interpreting your character anyway and so you, I think you can always over research a bit speaking of the audio plays you wrote there was Jubilee which has a bit of a connection with Dalek is it, it you've uh, mentioned before this you had a darker view of what made the Dalek scary can you sort of expand on that what was it that you thought made the Daleks scary that you brought to those episodes? I think it's more our view of the Daleks, actually. I, I think that what always bothered me about the Daleks, and it still does a bit, is the way that they're meant to represent Nazis. I mean, that's why Terry Nation, the original creator, came up with them. It was, it was you know, 18 years after the Second World War, um, and the... The big evil was the memory of Adolf Hitler, and therefore the Daleks are very, very much a reaction to that. And yet over the years they've become these lovable toys for children. And when the show was off the air, which of course is when I began writing for it, um, the Daleks were in kick out ads and they were just bits of laughable kitsch. And I thought, I think that there's a, a great danger in the world generally of of kind of trivialising, I, I think it's what we do, I, I, think, I think we make things safe. I think that things which are actually dangerous and dark and need, and need confronting over the years become things that we can, that we start to feel, we can box into an area saying, well oh, this is the past and the past is quite funny. So you know, and the way that, and again I love the movies, don't get me wrong, but the way that Indiana Jones will represent Nazis as, as, as comedy villains, but they're not. I mean, they are in those films, but they're not. And I think that I wanted with the Daleks to do a story in both Jubilee, the audio, and in the TV version of people not taking the Daleks seriously enough because they see it as kitsch and it proving them wrong because actually there's a real evil there. On that note, do you feel that you bring a certain political view to your writing and how do you do that in a way that people would say is hitting people over the head or do you think sometimes you need to hit people over the head with it? I hope I'm never too polemical. Um, I'm an entertainer. I mean, basically, I'm actually a comedian. I mean, but I think that through comedy in particular, we, we can reveal our interpretation of the world, which is often political. And I think that that's fine. I mean, I, I don't... It's not about subscribing to any political party because I'm not 
actually very committed politically at all. I mean, I'm one of those sort of... I'm, I'm quite wishy-washy, really. But I do think there are certain things which which uh, galvanise me and galvanise most writers. And I think that just writing about that relatively fearlessly... I think if you do it in a very, you know, very, very on the nose, it can be, as I, I think Jubilee probably was, a little bit obvious. You know, that's... It's OK to try that sometimes. Sometimes you just actually just want to say, this thing matters and let's just actually confront it. Nothing wrong with not having something like, you know, a, a political view creeping into your script. It's, it's not always appropriate. It's not always what the script's about. And you look at people like P.G. Woodhouse, one of my favourite writers, and one would identify him as being probably, because he never doesn't ever confront anything, as being therefore, one imagines, quite conservative. And, and perhaps he was. It's not, it's not a world he's trying to criticise. But I don't think that matters, because I, I, I think that... I think it depends really what you're writing. But if you write a lot, and you're trying to write, about, write at the world from different angles every time, inevitably you're going to reveal more and more of a political stance by doing that. I mean, I mean like Doctor Who is, 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 is unashamedly a, a liberal programme, which means that as soon as you start, you know, back with the new series, when you, as soon as you start casting... Um, a, a black boyfriend to a girl companion, that's going to cause comments in the Daily Mail about political correctness. In fact, it isn't necessarily politically correct, it's just, it's, it's actually trying to demonstrate your own view of actually, of how you think society works. And in Russell's case, that is clearly a, a, a liberal one, and quite rightly so. And some people, it's when you see people using the word liberal as if it's an insult. I, I think in this country, it's actually seen as, as usually rather a positive humanist thing. In America it's seen as, as, as a dangerous subversive thing. It, it, it depends actually how that's done. I think that that's what writers do. I, I think that writers are enacting the way that the you know, things that they wrestle with in their daily lives all the time and a lot of those are things are going to be social and um, you know the way in which they actually they want to see the world portrayed. So uh, what's next for you? What's the next big thing on your agenda? I've just finished a book. Um, I can't reveal who it's with yet because I'm not certain. Um, it's currently at a publisher's but we haven't got confirmation. It's quite strange. It's like a big war and peace link, choose your own adventure, um, short story novel thing. It's very odd and I'm excited by that. You follow me on Twitter or Facebook and I'll, I, as soon as I have news I will no doubt be, be urging people to, to maybe have a look. I, I'm very bad at self-promoting on Facebook and Twitter because I always feel embarrassed by it but, 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 but you get told to do it so I, I occasionally have to go out there and say hello I have a new book out and then people can ignore it if they wish. Well thank you very much for talking to us, it's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers.